Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, we're going to start this morning by singing three different songs. The first one we're going to sing is this handout that hopefully you have. If you don't, maybe raise your hand and maybe somebody at the back can grab a few for you. Um, but it's Psalm 122, and we're going to sing all four verses. The tune is very familiar. It's an old 1870s hope. But the words are different, so that's why we're singing it on the sheet instead of out of the way. Come Thou Almighty King, and we'll sing all four verses of that one also.
next one we're going to sing is in the celebration hymnal number 337. Um, we're going to do a share the Lord's Supper, share the communion today, and I think this is quite appropriate to acknowledge this is the only thing, the only thing that can wash away our sin is the blood of Jesus. We all have a stand for this one, I believe. Thank you. this congregation sing from up here. I'm going to have to forego my seat in the back from up here one of these days. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jim and Carla, for leading us and welcome everyone to this worship service. I'm really looking forward to being your pastor again. My prayer is that I will feed you every time we get together for worship. You inspire me, you encourage me, you strengthen me, and I love you. May God be praised. Congregation, receive uh, God's greeting. Our help is in the name of God, our Father, our Creator. Grace, mercy, and peace is yours from God the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ, by the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. And I want to welcome all who are watching uh, this service uh, online. May God bless you, and uh, may we be a blessing to you as well. For our prayer of confession, uh, Psalm 139, 
the first two verses. Search me, O God, and know my heart. The only person who is going to ask God to search my heart is that individual who knows God's love, God's grace, God's mercy. A self-righteous person will not do that. The one who knows his sin, the one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, they say, search my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let us pray. Our Father, so wonderful to be with your people, brothers, sisters, whom you have redeemed, whom you have loved before the creation of the world. Your love is unconditional. We come to you this morning, sinful sinners, we know our sin. Like Paul, the good we would, we do not practice. The evil I would not do, that I do. We confess our sins and we pray that you search our hearts, convict us of sin, and lead us in the way everlasting. In Jesus' name, Amen. For the assurance of pardon, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, but I want to read from that formulary found on page 984 and 985. We'll begin in the second column, 984, about halfway down where it says formulary. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was delivered up to be crucified, the Lord instituted the sacrament of Holy Communion, saying, do this in remembrance of me. In obedience to that command, we now celebrate this memorial feast. We therefore invite all of you who have confessed your Lord, who have truly examined yourselves as the Apostle Paul commanded, to come in repentance and assurance of faith to commune with Christ in this Holy Supper. And as we now draw near, let us acknowledge that the Lord has instituted his supper, so that by it we may remember him, and he may nourish and refresh us for eternal life. To observe this holy supper in remembrance of him is to proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. In partaking of this supper, therefore, we remember that our Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior, promised to the fathers in the Old Testament that he is the eternal and only begotten Son of God, that he assumed our human nature in which he fulfilled for us all obedience and the righteousness of God's law, that he bore for us the wrath of God under which we should have perished forever. We remember that he was bound that we might be loosed from our sins, that he was innocently condemned to death that we might be acquitted at the judgment seat of God, that he became a curse for us to fill us with his blessing, and that he humbled himself on the cross to hell's deep agony, which wrung from him the cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, that God might never forsake us. We remember also that he was buried to sanctify the grave for us, that he was raised for our justification, that he is, is exalted at God's right hand, and that he will come again to judge the living and the dead, 
and we remember that the shedding of his blood has confirmed for us the new and eternal testament, the covenant of grace. Through this supper, Jesus Christ assures us that he will truly nourish and refresh us with his crucified body and shed blood to everlasting life. He promises that in the institution to this supper, saying of the bread, this is my body, and of the wine, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. With these words, our Lord directs our faith to his perfect sacrifice, once offered on the cross as the holy ground of our salvation. He also assures us that by his death, he has taken away our sin, the cause of our eternal death, and has obtained for us the life-giving spirit. By this spirit who dwells in Christ as in the head and in us his members, he brings us into true communion with himself and makes us partakers of all his riches of eternal life righteousness and glory and by this same spirit he causes us together with all true believers to be united as members of one body as the holy apostle says we who are many are one body for we all partake of the one loaf and as it is said to us for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We are assured by this Holy Supper that our Lord Jesus will come again to receive us to himself and that we shall sit down with him and drink with him the fruit of the vine in the newness of our Father's kingdom. Does that comfort you? That's the gospel. Let us pray. Merciful God and Father, whose grace abounds beyond all our sins, we pray that in this supper in which we commemorate the death of your dear Son, you will so work in our hearts that we may yield ourselves ever more fully to Jesus Christ. May our contrite hearts, through the power of the Holy Spirit, be nourished and refreshed with his body and blood, with him, true God and man, the only heavenly bread, so that we may no longer live in our sins, but he in us and we in him. Confirm in us the covenant of grace, we pray, so that we may not doubt that you will forever be our gracious Father, no more imputing our sins to us, and abundantly providing us with all things necessary for body and soul as your dear children and heirs. Grant us your grace that we may cheerfully take up our cross, deny ourselves, confess our Savior, and in all temptations and trials, expect our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, who at his coming, will make our mortal bodies like his glorified body and take us to himself in eternity. Answer us, O God and merciful Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit belong all praise and adoration now and evermore. Amen. Before we go into prayer, here are a few announcements which I have been asked to make. Uh, Gary Crozier is suffering from a quite severe case of COVID, and he asks for our prayers. He says, I've never been this sick in my life. And maybe, Carolyn, you can identify with that. And I know you were here last week, but welcome back to both of you. Uh, also, I want to uh, thank God. You're doing well, Doug? A slow, but yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> We're very happy for God's grace in your life, and you will continue to recover. 
Uh, the orphans are doing really well. Uh, I'll be sending Kiri some more information. They're eating catfish three times a week from those fish which they purchased with the money that some of you sent. Uh, there is another outbreak of COVID in uh, Phnom Penh. That's about eight hours from San Marie, where the orphans are. But the orphans are not affected. They are going to school every day. And David sends his love and his thanks to all of you. So we will keep those in our prayer. Are there other prayer needs which you have? Glenn. Thank you, Lord. Marv and Sandy are being able to come back to church also. They're way in the back. I can't yeah. see them back there. <laughs> they're, hiding. they're hiding back there. I'm sorry. I, it's, you're so common in church when I'm here. But I'm really happy. Marvin, you want to update us on your condition? Well, I don't know what to say because every test I take seems like they come back good. <laughs> Continue to keep you in prayer, Marvin, and hopefully the doctors can find what's ailing you. And Sandy, what's your report? I'm waiting three more weeks before I can put any weight on my foot. Three more weeks. So you're just really enjoying a break, right? <laughs> and I hear a lot of people are bringing you food from this congregation and their children. The fellowship of saints is so rich in this church. Any others? Yes. Thank you, Ryan Nicole could be here for the first time in a year. Thank you. See, you're so familiar to me too. I don't come to church here very often <laughs> because I'm always preaching someplace else. It's so wonderful to see you, Ryan and Nicole, and your kids are growing up. How's Beckett doing? Good. Good. We got a lot stronger this last year. He still takes medicine two times a day that we got to give him, but hopefully this spring we're going to cut that back. So, so he's still on medication that's going to be cut back. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Anybody else? Let us pray together. Our Father, it's so wonderful to be in church here in Tracy. All of your people who you have redeemed from sin, whom you bring into your courts. We love you, Father, because you have always loved us. You chose us before the creation of the world to make us holy and righteous in your sight. Our lives are so blessed. Our hearts are so enriched by your word, by your spirit. Show so wonderful that you don't count our sins against us, that you continue to give us grace and to give us mercy. It's wonderful to wake up every morning in your arms under your wonderful authority, your sovereignty. You keep us, you lead us, you guide us. And it's just a joy that you have brought us back together in a, another time of being pastor and flock. Father, I just praise you that we can have this wonderful relationship and I pray that you will give me strength, give me your spirit so that I can preach your word faithfully and thoroughly in a way that gives 
joy and peace and comfort to your people and that you will bless this congregation with your spirit and your word so that together we build each other up and we can sing psalms and hymns together and enjoy fellowship with each other. We pray for our brother Gary. May you bless him. These viruses are yours. You control them. You have a purpose with this epidemic. It's not out of your control. You're sovereign. We pray that you will bless Gary. You will give him strength as he endures lots of suffering in this moment. We commend Gary to your care, to your love, to your grace, to your mercy. Bless Jana. She be blessed caring for him and you protect her. We thank you to see uh, Marvin and Sandy with us. We pray for your blessing on them. May you give wisdom to the doctors and insight. May you bless Sandy as she sees only three more weeks of waiting before she can put weight on her foot. We just thank you to see them this morning. May you bless them. We are so blessed to see Ryan and Paul and the children. We pray for your abundant blessing to rest on them. May you bless Beckett so that he continues to bring, gain strength we commend them to your wonderful love, to your wonderful care. And so, Father, we pray for Doug, and she will continue to give him strength, continue to heal him. Thank you for the successful surgery. And we pray for the orphans and David and his mother as they minister to these children and young people so faithfully. May you bless them. And may you bless others who are listening to us in Nepal and in Cambodia and in Korea and in Brazil. May your Holy Spirit bless them with the word, with the singing, so that they too Know your love, know your grace, know your power. We commend them to your care. Now as we prepare to hear your word, we pray for your blessing on me. And I am given the words to speak. And that the Holy Spirit will feed us all. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll receive the offering at this time.
Psalm 23, found on page 23 in your Psalter. <laughs> Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I've told you before, but I want to remind you. The Psalms are Israel's song book. They are Israel's catechism book. And they're Israel's prayer book. I've always loved being in churches that sang the Psalms. Because I believe every song that we sing in this church 
is to sing of the doctrines of the church. They should express the truth of God, the truth of Christ, the truth of the Holy Spirit, and the truth of man, and the truth of salvation. We will never sing, I have decided to follow Jesus if I'm in charge of the singing in this church because there is no scripture foundation that I have decided anything. It is God's power, God's work, God's authority. And that is what David is saying in this psalm. He's not saying I have decided to follow the Lord. He's making a statement, a confession of faith. And David is a very interesting character. Because I have said it before and I will say it again, he's Israel's greatest songwriter, the greatest poet, greatest king, greatest warrior, and the greatest sinner. Don't think the Psalms that he wrote, he wrote 73 of them, are, are wonderful expressions of what a wonderful boy I am, what a wonderful man I am. It's about a man, a saint, a seasoned saint, who knows God's grace. And in my life, and I think in your life, the most beautiful people, the most wonderful are those who know God's grace. Correct? Because I know I will receive grace from them. Now, David did not write Psalm 71. Asaph did. He was a songwriter. He was a choir director. And in Psalm 71, verse 18, he writes this beautiful verse, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, until I teach your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Nobody sitting here is retired. We are all given that wonderful privilege, that wonderful joy of rehearsing to our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren the power of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the beauty of God, the leadership of God, the sovereignty of God, the wisdom of God in my life and in your life. Janet, I read that you're going to be, you have a birthday next Sunday, right? The 28th. And so when I read, you know, Psalm 71, 18, <laughs> that is a beautiful challenge for all of us. That's what David did in Psalm 23. David is no young kid out under a tree watching his dad's sheep when he wrote Psalm 23. He's an old man. There's a fullness in Psalm 23, a man who has lived a full life. And he's reflecting on his life and he's saying, I am who I am because of the Lord has been my shepherd through all my life. I said that wrong. It's not has been. It's is. Now, the Lord, there are notes someplace. Are they on the back of something? Now yeah, they're, they're put on the back. On the back side. Okay, I don't print my sermons out because I don't like to be controlled by what I thought 
on Monday or Tuesday. And so I want this to be fresh. I want it spirit-led. You will not read the name Lord in Genesis chapter 1. Every time it is God, in the beginning, God created, and God said, and God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. The first time that you read the Lord is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And in the rest of chapter 2 and going into chapter 3, it's Lord God. And that is very significant. Because there are many names that God uses in his revelation of himself. In Genesis 1, it is Elohim, the Hebrew name for the God of power, the God of creativity, the sovereign God. Genesis 1 is very powerful because Genesis 1 is not only about origins, it is about who God is. The doctrine of God, what we know about God, has its beginning origin out of Genesis chapter 1. And when Moses meets God at the burning bush, and God calls him, and then Moses says, okay, uh, but what is your name? What am I going to tell the Israelites? And then you have that mysterious answer where God says, I am who I am. What that means is Elohim, the God who creates, the God of power, the sovereign God, the omniscient God. That means the God who knows everything, everything. He knows what you're going to have for lunch today. Understand that? <laughs> Ever think about that? Everything God knows. That God is eternal. We are creatures of time. It was yesterday, and it's now, and it's tomorrow. God says, I am. I change not. Malachi 3, verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, O children of Jacob, you're not consumed. Isn't that beautiful? Man is changing. You don't know what side of the bed they got up on this morning. God is unchangeable. He cannot change. When he chose you before the creation of the world to make you holy and blameless in his sight, he can never, never, never change that. You understand that? That is the sovereignty of God. Your sin will never separate you from God. If you are a sheep. Now, that's what God means. I am who oh, I am. That's first person. If you remember your English class, there's first person, I, me. There's second person, you. 
your. And then there's third person, he, she, and it. When you come to the word Lord, you are speaking third person. Did you know that? And what it really translates, instead of I am who I am, it's saying he is who he is. It's because God's people, God's sheep, call him Lord. You and I who grew up in the old King James, it was Jehovah coming from the Hebrew name Yahweh. And so when David is saying the Lord, David is making a confession of his condition. The Lord owns me. The Lord has covenant with me because the word Lord is the covenant name. And God cannot break his covenant with you or with me or anyone he's made his covenant with. I make with you an everlasting covenant. Don't ever forget that. That is what we're talking about here. Now, the next word is, is. What does is mean? Whoa. Is means this is the way things are. Today is Sunday, right? Let me ask you about it. What did you and I have to do with today being Sunday? Anybody? We are passive. Passive. You boys and girls, you study passive in, uh, in, in English class? Passive means it was done to you. You probably have a lot of things when you're a young boy, young girl, you're passive. Mom makes the, the, you know, the meal. Dad drives you to church and all that stuff. You're passive. <laughs> David is saying the same thing. The Lord is my shepherd. I had nothing to do with it. The shepherd chooses his sheep. Now, maybe in the history of your farming career, you've had some sheep wander up on your yard. I don't know. But it's not yours. And you can say to that sheep, I never knew you. Away from me. <laughs> A shepherd chooses his sheep. That is so comforting. David writes about that in, in Psalm 16, uh, 5 to 10. I won't read it all. The Lord is my chosen portion, my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. That's what is means. This is will always be. He will be your and my shepherd through every day of our earthly life. And when we die, he's our shepherd. When the angels take our soul to heaven, he's our shepherd. Our days in heaven, he's our shepherd. And when there's the resurrection and our souls are brought down and our bodies are raised incorruptible and we live in this new earth, not a different one, this one made new. 
He's our shepherd, and he will be your and my shepherd forever and ever and ever and ever. That is beauty. That's wonderful. That clears up a lot of stuff. And now he says, he's my shepherd. That's a very personal, very intimate, very wonderful thing to say. Because there are two things about knowing God as a shepherd. You can know about God being a shepherd. And that'll do you no good. But when you can say, I know God. I shouldn't be using the word God, Lord. I know the Lord God is my shepherd. That's a whole different thing. The prodigal son is a fine example of someone who can say, Ma, he's wasted half of his dad's estate. He's wasted his life. He's broke. He's eating pig food. And by the grace of God in his life, God speaks to him and he's reminded of his dad. And he gets to thinking, my dad has food. My dad has shelter. I'm going to go back to my dad. I'm going to say, dad, I'm sorry. I'm not your son. I don't deserve to be your son. Just make me your servant, pay me a little money, I'll take care of myself, and you don't have to worry. That'll be a good deal, Dad. And then he comes home, and you know what Dad does? This father loves his son. And this son is clothed in the righteousness of his dad. His dad says, bring out the best robe in the house and cover my son. And the best robe in the house is the father's robe. And this son is covered in the righteousness Maybe that's a good place to stop. Can we leave the word shepherd until next week? Okay. I, I'm mindful of the clock and we're going to celebrate communion together. And I think it's a very wonderful way to, uh, to go into communion itself. And so, I need to follow my, my notes here. We are going to continue here. I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to say the Apostles' Creed together. That's where we are in that form. And the elders, you may come up at any, any time you want. <clears throat> Congregation, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. That we may be nourished with Christ, the true bread from heaven, let us lift up our hearts to Christ Jesus, our advocate, at the right hand of his heavenly Father. 
and let us firmly believe all his promises, not doubting that as surely as we receive the bread and wine in remembrance of him, we shall be nourished and refreshed with his body and blood through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, we're going to be singing, uh, and the words will appear up on the wall. Uh, as the bread is served, we're going to be singing two verses of um, O Come My Soul, sing praise to God. During the wine, two more verses, and then it will be our doxology. bread which we break is a communion of the body of Christ. Jesus Christ was broken for complete forgiveness, complete forgiveness of all of your sins.
take, drink, remember and believe. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for complete forgiveness of all your sins. Let us pray together. Oh, merciful Father, we thank you with all our hearts that in your boundless grace, you have given us your only begotten Son as a mediator and a sacrifice for our sins and as our food and our drink unto life eternal. We thank you too for giving us the true faith through which we can partake of your benefits. And since your Son Jesus Christ ordained the Holy Supper to strengthen our faith, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, this supper may increase our faith and enrich our fellowship with Christ. May you also use this proclamation of our Lord's death and resurrection to bring others into this blessed fellowship so that all your children may be gathered in to share with us the joy of your salvation. Hear us, Heavenly Father, in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us stand to sing the last verse of Psalm 103.